Thank you very much. Um, sorry for the short delay, but it was a good opportunity to bring uh, more people into the room. So thank you very much for being here for the um, 2023 session of the Dynamic Coalition on Children's Rights in the Digital Environment. I know you can go and navigate many paths in the agenda, the, the impressive agenda of, of the IGF, and so we're really happy that you are here. Um, there are also, as we speak, some similar uh, child rights focused sessions uh, going on. So thank you for choosing this and I hope that you'll have the opportunity to, to perhaps watch online some of the other sessions and engage with the speakers in those sessions as well. Um, so as we all know, the theme for this year's um, IGF is the internet we want empowering all people. And the Dynamic Coalition, which I will explain a little bit um, and we can ex talk about throughout this session, um, has a clear starting point that, that for us as, as children's rights advocates, there can be no empowerment on or through the internet without a found in foundation of safety. And the internet we want and the internet we need is one where children's rights are guaranteed and that includes speaking to them about um, their views about their digital lives and the online world. Um, and of course, that's not just me or our coalition or my fellow panelists um, saying this. Um, we can also refer, and for those of you coming from the previous session um, on digital rights um, in uh, different regions around the world, um, we have now um, something called the General Comment Number 25 to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child that recognizes children's rights in relation to the digital environment. And that was adopted several uh, two, uh, two years ago. And this obliges state parties to protect children in digital environments from all forms of exploitation and abuse. So what this means is the rights that children have in the offline world, if we can call it that, are also guaranteed online. And I think this is crucial for the context in which we are meeting today. So in that context, when we talk about the AI, the metaverse, new technologies, frontier technologies, as we've seen at this IGF, it's clearly at the forefront of discussion. It's, it's, it's across the agenda very heavily. There are a lot of sessions talking about um, regulation, frameworks, guidance, uh, opportunities, risks of, of these kind of new technologies. And we know, um, you know they are increasingly embedded in the lives of digital platform users worldwide. Um, um, so we see that legislation, digital policy, safety policy, design practice, digital experiences are at a critical moment of transition. And innovation, it's not new, it's, it's core to our human societies. Um, it does actually define us. There is a pace of change perhaps that we're seeing right now that requires us to really stop and pay attention and consider what these implications may be um, and how we can harness the positive opportunities for, for the next you know, the next, the next uh, uh, generations. Um, yes, indeed, I think we all agree on a starting point for this panel, we'll, we will be balancing this conversation about the power of, the transformative power of technologies, um, but also looking at how we mitigate the risks and address harms, um, some of which we can talk about very directly and concretely today, some of which we can probably predict and some which we cannot predict. This is the nature of, of the evolving environment. Um, we do know that, that, uh, that governments often find themselves playing catch up. There is a huge regulatory debate right now, but in, in many ways, in too many ways, it's responsive to the problem after it's happened. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about you know, moving to a more, more preventive upstream model of safety by design. How do we prevent things happening before um, um, they, they take place and how can we build at the same time those uh, uh, the, the environments and communities online for children and everyone to, to thrive and be well and you know uh, uh, progress. Um, we've also seen that some online companies, technology providers are not equal in that understand your commitment to design. I think that's something that's crucial for us to address. How can we all um, uh, work with companies of different sizes to actually scale and, and, and share best practice and knowledge um, in these areas? Um, and the questions I think that we need to ask is how we talk, how we move from talk to action, how we move from policy to practice. This is also something that has come up in many of the sessions I have attended. Um, we need to act. We need to be smart about the policies and laws we develop but really the proof is in the implementation. The proof is in how we actually uh, use these for the benefit of society and how we localize these and make them relevant to the specific context in which we are implementing these policies and practices. 
Um, we also need to think very seriously about how we assess and mitigate the risks of new technologies so that we can ensure safety, but also champion opportunity um, that, that tech provides for, for millions, billions of people living on this planet. So some of the goals of the session are to identify the main impacts of AI and new technologies on children globally, understand, um, hear from young, uh, one young panelist, but also I see some, some younger participants in the room. I'm really looking forward to hearing your views on this um, and uh, to raise awareness for a real a child rights based approach to um, AI based service development. And perhaps at the end, I'll take the opportunity to, to um, talk a little bit about the Dynamic Coalition on Children's Rights as a vehicle within the IGF to really bring together organizations interested in um, ensuring children's rights are mainstream within internet governance policies worldwide. And we would love you to join us. We have some flyers and some QR codes, so you can't escape. You don't have to write anything down. Um, and you can consider joining the coalition so we can actually move, move forward. Um, so uh, I'm really pleased to introduce our speakers as well. We have two speakers online and uh, three speakers uh, sitting next to me. Um, we have, perhaps I'll start with um, the online uh, participants since they've joined us very early, so they get the special prize. Um, I have Patrick Burton, who's the Executive Director of the Center for Justice and Crime Prevention in South Africa. Patrick, good morning. Um, I have Sophie Pola from the Media Edu She's a Media Education Consultant at the um, German Children's Fund. Thank you very much for joining us, Sophie. Here in the room, I have to my right, uh, Liz Thomas, who's the Director of Public Policy and um, Digital Safety at Microsoft. I have uh, Jenna Fung, um, who is a youth advocate for youth-led youth -led initiatives online. She's representing the Asia Pacific IGF, Youth IGF, and she's part of the Youth Track organizing team as well. And last but very much not, not least, I have uh, Kat Takeda, who is the Executive Director of Child Fund Dep Japan, um, who can also uh, give us a uh, perspective from the wonderful country in which we are we are attending uh, this event. Um, so thank you very much. Before we go forward, I wanted to just uh, take a show of hands because this is a round table. The seating makes it a little bit harder to make it a round table. So, you know, a bit of audience participation. So um, perhaps you could raise your hand if you're from civil society in the room. From uh, government, uh -huh. raised hand. Uh, from private sector, good to have you. And from from any other, ah, <laughs> and um, uh, and from the different regions, we have some. I think some colleagues from uh, Asia Pacific region and Euro European. Yeah, from any colleagues from Middle East. Thank you for joining us. Latin America, no, and Europe, from Europe, well, I'm from Europe, so, yeah, and the Americas, yeah, great, great to have you. So we have, we can have a global conversation, I think, we do, we are lacking some regions, but it's really great to have you all here, thank you, for, thank you for being here. Um, I should introduce myself, my name is Amy Crocker, I work for an organization, please, um, called ECPAT International. It, we are a global civil society network dedicated to ending the sexual exploitation of children. And um, I'm here as moderator today as uh, uh, the chair or coordinator of the Dynamic Coalition on Children's Rights in the Digital Environment here at the IGF. Um, so this is a 90 minute round table. You've already, I've already taken up a lot of the time, so we will go on. We're gonna organize this um, in terms of three themes. And what we'd like is, you know, within each theme um, to, to hear your reflections, take your questions. So we make this as much of a conversation as we can. Um, and the first theme is um, broad, but crucial. And it's on uh, safety and children's rights being a cornerstone of the internet that we want and need. This is our proposition, but it's also a challenge, I think, to the internet governance community um, and to, to governments and, and companies and society uh, worldwide. Um, so um, what I'm gonna do is perhaps uh, start with you, Sophie, online, if I may. Um, and perhaps you could tell us a little bit about um, your views on why children's rights are so, digital rights are so from fundamental to our construction of a safe, equitable, and secure online world. Um. 
Yes, thanks, Amy. And um, hello, everybody from Germany. It's very early here in the morning. <laughs> but I hope um, I can give you some, some insights in, in the German perspective uh, on children's um, rights in the digital world. Um, maybe just a quick background. Um, I work in the Coordination Office for Children's Rights in the German Children's Fund, and we accompany the strategies of the European Union and the Council of Europe on the rights of the child in Germany here, uh, and among others, uh, other things with a strong focus on children's rights in the digital world. Um, yes, Amy, you've already mentioned it, uh, the General Command 25 published by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child in 2021 sums up the importance of um, children's digital rights and um, provides a very comprehensive framework um, for this context. And um, yeah, the rights are crucial really to protect children from harm, but also promote their access to information and empower them with digital skills. And um, also important is uh, that the rights of provision, protection and participation must be given equal consideration and are really of fundamental importance um, for the digital world. Um, so upholding these rights is not only an ethical imperative, um, but also an investment in the well-being of future generations and the society as a whole. Um, and maybe um, a quick, um, quick German perspective, which is um, uh, quite concrete. Um, uh, we have, uh, as, as German Children's Fund, uh, um, we have looked into um, needs and challenges voiced by children when it comes to risks arising from online interaction. Um, so, um, we have analyzed the research field on this question on how children deal with interaction risks, um, such as insults, bullying or harassment in online environments. And um, therefore we've conducted a meta research and compiled an overview of relevant studies with a focus on German children, uh, how they uh, develop um, coping strategies and how we can promote this focused on the age group from nine to 13. And we've gained some interesting findings from the reviewed studies uh, when it comes to children's perspectives on online safety. Um, just a quick disclaimer, this was not in the context of um, artificial intelligence, but um, we still consider uh, the results relevant to our discussion today. And I'd like to pick some, some uh, important points uh, for, for the discussion today and later maybe. Um, the younger the children, the more important it is for them to have a social safety net in case of online risks. They particularly want support from parents, confidence or teachers and especially, particularly, parents are perceived as the most significant and desired um, safety contact persons um, for young children. As children grow older, they increasingly resort to technical strategies to deal with online risks, such as blocking, reporting, deleting comments, enabling comment function. Um, and this points to the considerable importance of the safe design in online spaces, which must be adapted to the needs of each age group. Um, the youngsters um, voiced that platform related reporting functions are seen critically by them uh, because the platform side processing of reports takes too long in their eyes and sometimes even fails to occur altogether. Um, they want more information on how to report people, how to block people and how to protect themselves from uncomfortable or risky interactions, um, especially sexual interactions. And this indicates that they need more education to make a more informed um, decision when coping. And um, last but not least, um, two points from, from a, a study uh, from Thorn uh, conducted two years ago in the US, so not from Germany, uh, but they have some interesting findings when it comes to reporting. Uh, first, uh, anonym anonymity plays an important role for adolescents, especially uh, for young girls. Um, they report that they would be more likely to use um, technical tools if they um, could be sure their report would remain anonymous. And um, very interesting, at the same time, this study results also show 
that adolescents would welcome a human connection in the reporting process in addition to anonymity. So the big majority of the nine to 12 year olds uh, we've looked at um, said they would be more willing to use reporting tools that connect users with a human than with an automatic system. And um, yeah, just a quick insight, there are more findings, um, but uh, those uh, highlight the importance really of human resources, as well as safe design for children in coping with risks online. Thank you, Sophie. And you've, you, you've touched upon, you know, the, the second and third theme that we will be talking about, which is on the one side regulation and policy for safety, and that can be, you know, government policy, uh, platform policy, and then also the issue of, of, of safe design, and, and we'll, we'll go into those. And I think, you know, it, it's really interesting, you know, obviously drawing on research conducted with, with children, um, when we take a rights-based approach, um, you said, you know, you, you, you won't be um, talking, this, this study wasn't specifically talking about AI, but indeed, if we take a rights-based approach, it is about rights, um, perhaps about principles and values, and the technology itself should, um, be, be, uh, uh, should be responding to those needs rather than the other way around. Um, so I think before we go on to sort of some of the some of the other issues around regulation and policy, I also want to turn to you, Katz, if I may, um, to to talk about. I mean, we've heard from uh, uh, from Germany um, to talk about in in the Japanese perspective um, your experience of of uh, doing your work based on children's rights and what that means in terms of um, creating. Um, safety nets, um, meeting the needs of children, understanding their thoughts so that you can help advocate for them based on, 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 on their rights. Yes, thank you for invite me, inviting me to this uh, IGF and especially this dynamic coalition session. So l let me share some of the uh, facts from Japan. Um, but before then is I have to say is uh, child rights is a fundamental part of this, uh, how to say, work and uh, societies everywhere. And uh, we are, as a child fund is a, how to say, child focus agencies, we are promoting child rights everywhere. But uh, we face several challenges so far. So we conducted some kind of uh, omnibus survey uh, recently, it's in August. So this is uh, a age from 15 to 75 years old. It's a quite long, quite wide range. This is a kind of a image of the public opinion. So we have a question about the uh, definition of the CSAM, CSAM, and also including some of the questions about AI. So uh, let me share some of the challenges here. Then uh, s the result said is, uh, how to say, is uh, some of the internal conflict between the human rights, especially the child rights and also freedom of expression. So this is a maybe a never ending conflict everywhere maybe not only in Japan, some other countries. I want to know some other countries' practices or situation later on. And uh, this is, but uh, we think is uh, we need to kind of balance between the two conflicts. Otherwise, we cannot continue to never ending discussion between the child rights and ex freedom expressions. And secondly, I have to say, I want to share this one, some kind of misunderstanding or misinterpretation of human rights. So we, we ask this kind of a virtual CSAM and also CSAM to the uh, respondents. Is uh, some of the uh, respond and some comments, narrative comments said is, uh, virtual CSAM, CSAM will prevent real crime. So this is kind of a misunderstanding or misinterpretation of human rights, especially the child rights. We need to more 
awareness or education to the public for this one. And third reason I want to share this one is uh, the one of the re result of the public opinion is uh, the question about AIs. As many of them is uh, how say, we should regulate AI under the context of the CSAM, CSAM. But still is a minority is a disagree on this how say, regulation. But interestingly, is 20% of the how say, uh, ans res respond is we don't know or I don't know about the AI matters or AI risk. This is quite interesting and also some kind of risk in the future. So probably we should more focus, uh, how say, awareness to the public about the risk of the AI and also the opportunity of AI in the future. So that is uh, uh, one of the, some of the our results. So I just, I just, how say, share these three points, but uh, maybe later on, so I want to hear from you about some other thoughts or insight or some kind of a result or research about the similar, similar work on your country. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And I think you pick up on a, you know, a really crucial point is how, you know, children's rights are understood and, and sort of made real within societies, how they're realized, um, which often will be dependent on, on, on a local context um, based on principles that, that we, have, we have agreed on globally, um, but also helping people understand technology um, and the risks and opportunities. And I think this is a challenge. Um, um, and maybe something, Liz, you, you, you will speak to later, um, how, how, people, how you make technology explainable enough that people understand the different sides of it um, when they're using it. And, and indeed, I think we will talk a little bit later about um, parents and the empowerment of parents. And I think this is something that has come up many times in conversations I've been hearing this week. So um, speaking about children's rights, um, Jenna, I'll turn to you to tell us that we're all talking rubbish. No, um, I'd love to hear your um, sort of uh, from your perspective on how your experience of how children's rights can be used um, to advocate for youth and, and whether you think we're, we're, you we're doing that in the right way. Sure, I will try my best. Um, as I work so closely with the youth um, in my own region in Asia Pacific, um, most of the people who are involved in this YIGF, they kind of have some sort of knowledge about what we're doing here. And the youth that is engaged in those conversations, they're over 18. But then as we talk about children, they're very young. And so, you know, today I will add some and bring out some points as, you know, from those outcomes that we have discussed in Asia Pacific, but try to, we'll try to have some more representation and we definitely not um, represent like teenager, which I personally see that they are the one that face a lot of difficult like challenges online these days, but I will touch on it a little bit later as I prepare some notes here and hope that I won't disappoint the audience here today. I believe you've, not you've, sorry, correct myself, kids today, they live and breathe the online world. They practically born with internet and tech gadgets in the hand, which many of, of us don't really get to experience or dream of back in the day, even myself as a Gen Seer. I don't get to experience that. I only get to get introduced to a computer or internet when I was in kindergarten. Um, but you know, kids these days, they, they have their smartphones or iPads in hand as soon as their parents play the baby shark, they stop crying, right? That's what they're dealing with these days. It may be a bit dramatic to frame it this way, but before they were born, the photos, everything, are filling up the parents' um, social media feed. That's basically how I find out my high school buddies like become parents. Uh, and probably because their parents are Gen Z and like posting on social media a lot. You know, these kids today, 
this day, they don't really get to choose because they are not born yet, but they're already online. So it complicates our conversation even more. It might not always be the case because there are people who choose to be online, but somehow, you know, it is happening a lot more because of how different generations will use like internet or technologies. And I think with all this, we must talk about trust. This is like one of the biggest thing we also touch on a lot in the Asia Pacific Youth IGF and within our own youth community as well, because this is basically the bedrock of digital age, we believe. In a world where tech, uh, we rely on technology for almost everything. I guess we don't have to explain too much after the pandemic. Without the internet or technologies, we can't really live during that time. So trust is really become the, the glue that holds everything together. Um, and uh, digital age make trust really crucial um, against the backdrop of growing reliance on technologies and possible risks related to data breaches, data privacy problems, and unethic unethical practices. So building trust and imparting fundamental digital knowledge are essential steps in creating a reliable and ethically responsible digital environment for the younger generations. Our society has e evolved a lot to embrace diversity in terms of backgrounds, culture, sexual orientations, and more. With the progress that we have accomplished, potential harms and risks multiply. And the challenges of teenagers that face and encounter today probably way more uh, multifaceted than those of the past. And I myself can't even relate. And I really hope that the we will have a mechanism to engage those teenager, technically they're underage, to be in the conversation so I can hear from them. I can't speak for them because I am not them. Naming some classic examples from that, cyberbullying, we are still talking about it. Um, in early age, uh, I mean, early stage of the internet, you know, flaming, trolling, harassment through emails. Uh, now it's different, it's not more, more than emails. Um, uh, where today, where younger generations facing more than just social media bullying, it's now that they're um, encompassing a wider range of challenges like hate speech, doxing, cyber stalking, or one of the mo most concerned ones like hate um, image based abuse, especially with the rise of generative AI. It just makes everything uh, very easy, easy, relatively easier to, to do. And so that's like one of the things um, that uh, I think there are the encounters like just complicated than before. And uh, when underage face such challenge, it's very natural for them to turn to parents. Because, uh, I mean, it's just natural. Talk to someone you trust. Sometimes it may not be their own parent, but someone they trust. Um, but, you know, to provide a safety net for underage, uh, the guardian can't do it alone and they must know something. Um, not all the parents or guardian would have the same level of knowledge of anyone in this room. And so, you know, especially when there's like nuances on the risk that young children and teenagers are exposed to, it's totally a different thing. I think um, it's like a responsibility. It's shared by all stakeholders in terms of like safeguarding the younger generations that um, on how to uh, on this very topic, and uh, I probably should stop here and save the rest of the point when we move on to team two, theme two and three. And I hope that uh, I, I have already brought some uh, new insights from the younger generations because, as I observed, there's like only a few youth that's interested in these kind of topic, and and I hope that I represent a small part portion of it here today. Thank, Thank you, you so much. No, you absolutely did. And you've touched upon some really good points that set us up for the next uh, topic. But of course, they're all, they're all interrelated. And, and I really like that you mentioned the word trust. I think this is a really important word in these times. Trust in algorithms when we talk about AI, trust in institutions, trust in 
companies trust in parents. You know, do, do some children, that many children don't have a trusted adult um, that they can rely upon to help them. So I think we have a lot of different issues we need to uh, 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 sort of unpack. Before we go on to talk about everyone's favorite topic of regulations and policies um, at just after lunch, so we're at risk of everyone falling asleep. Um, no, I'd, I'd love to hear from the room if there are any perspectives on how you've how you've found um, building your work upon a basis of children's rights useful, challenging, difficult. I don't know if there are any perspectives um, I could call out. I think we have some colleagues from Brazil who just uh <laughs> did some uh, a, a wonderful session um, and you had some uh, videos of, of ch children themselves speaking. Uh, I don't know if you'd like to speak or anyone else in the room about how you've used children's rights practically in your work to to um, to do the work that you do. Thank you. I'm Larry Magid from Connect Safely. So in previous IGFs, we've had some workshops that I would co-lead called children's rights versus ch child protection and the tension between the two. We could protect everyone in this room by putting our in bubble wrap and never letting you out of your bed, although you would probably die from some bed-related disease. But the point is that, that being active in the world automatically creates some risk, and clearly being online creates some risk. Everyone knows that. And so we want to protect children, but at the same time, we want to protect their rights. And sometimes those are in conflict. And where it becomes particularly critical is in the area of legislation, because even in the United States, which has a, as you all know, has something we call the First Amendment, which if you read the First Amendment in the American Constitution, it says nothing about how old you have to be. It doesn't say people over 18 have the right to free speech. It says everyone has a right of free speech. Well, it doesn't really say that, but that's what it, how it's interpreted. But at the same time, there are laws being proposed in America which would, for example, prohibit children from under 18 to go online without parental permission. So that means a 17-year-old exploring their sexuality, their politics, their religion, or whatever would have to go to their parents for the right to express themselves. As everybody here, I'm sure, is aware, the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child guarantees children the right of freedom of expression, participation, assembly, et cetera. So these are in conflict, which is not to say that we should allow five-year-olds to look at hardcore pornography. I mean, I'm not arguing that we completely um, enable, empower all children to do all things, but at the same time, how do we ensure their rights and protect them at the same time without suppressing their rights? And frankly, if you were to ask some legislators, at least in the United States, and I think it's true in other countries, they would favor protection over rights and would take away their rights in the name of protection. And it becomes particularly uh, of an issue when there are marginalized groups that are engaged in controversial activities, whether it's politics or uh, transsexual issues or other issues where their rights are being suppressed by legislation in name uh, reportedly to protect them. So I just think that's an important backdrop. And even though that's not, that workshop is not on the agenda at this IGF, it's probably more important today than it was even the last time we had that conversation two or three years ago. Because again, I can only speak for my country, there is more and more legislation that would essentially deny children their rights for participation online. Thank you. Thanks, and I don't know if anyone wants to speak to that, but I think absolutely, and, and I, 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 there may not be a, 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 a session on the agenda, but it's certainly something that has come up many times in, in the conversations we've all been having and at different sessions, and it is, the, the, it, it is a huge challenge we face. I wish I had the answer. Um, in some ways, I feel like we need to embrace those conflicts because we're always going to be navigating those conflicts. Um, but when I think when we go on to, to regulation and policy, w we need to really critically assess, um, you know, what we're trying to gain through different regulations and how those should be shaped. And, and yeah, I'll, I'll just speak to that. So we have two questions on line. Um, your question while we're waiting, yeah. Well, thank you, and it's a follow-up on what Larry pointed out, uh, Larry Maggot. I'm Steve DelBianco with NetChoice, and two of the U.S. states which have aggressively attempted to ostensibly protect 
children extended all the way up to the age of 18, a requirement a requirement that any user of any social media site, even something like uh, YouTube.com, would have to present two forms of government-issued ID to make sure that the services knew that was an adult. And if they were younger than 18, they would have had to show that a legal guardian or parent had given verifiable consent for them to use a site. And it's fine to protect a 13-year-old or a 12-year-old, but it was a little ridiculous applying to a 17-year-old. And my organization, NetChoice, sued two states that had these laws, the state of Arkansas, the state of California. And last month, just a few weeks ago, we obtained a preliminary injunction blocking the state from enforcing those laws, which looks terrible for the tech industry to be suggesting that a state was wrong to try to protect children. But in fact, the judges ruled that the state was wrong to do it the way they were doing it. And in that mix will be a, an argument about the rights of a 17-year-old to access the kind of content that Larry brought up. And since your question was specifically about the rights of the child, if you dive into the document that's on every other chair, the best interest of the child is supposed to be a balancing test. Whenever I say that, I get heartburn thinking about GDPR, but it's a balancing test about the rights of the child to access and express versus the need to protect the child from harm. So I think you bring up the, the right framing of the question, and I realize that other nations that run into the same problem Larry and I are in the United States, they may not be able to rely upon a court system and a First Amendment and the Constitution to, to, or to block a state from going that way. But we need to educate lawmakers or they will write laws that are mainly messaging bills where they get to claim they're trying to protect children when in fact the mechanisms to do it on uh, age verification just don't exist. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. I mean, and of course, we could have a whole kind of week-long session about these topics. I'm going to move now, because in the interest of time, to the Bangladesh Remote Hub. There seem to be many of you. Great. Please, go away. Go tell us your question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm from England, but my English is poor. I, I do apologize. Please, please give us your question. Um, uh, hello, all. I'm Tasmi Chodhuri. Uh, Joint Secretary of Women IGF, Bangladesh, and Media Personality. Uh, dear moderator and today's event, greetings to all present. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to ask my question. How do we ensure that AI strategies, policies, and ethical guidelines protect and uphold child rights across the world, especially developing countries like Bangladesh? Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, for the for question. We have another question from Bangladesh. Remote Hub. Uh, can we speak? Yes, please. Okay. Thanks a lot to allow us. I am Diyadasan Baksha, Bangladesh, uh, ICR Bangladesh Inta IGF. My question is, AI adoption among children can present many real things. Data privacy being cheap among them. Popular chatbots like Synapses, My MyEI can quickly extract and process vast amounts of personal data, potentially exposing children to cyber threats, targeted advertising and inappropriate content. How we ensure a secure cyberspace for the children? Thank you. Thank you very much for those questions. And I think that th th they are big questions. Um, but I think it leads us very well on to sort of the, 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 the topic of regulation policies around some of these really challenging child rights and child protection issues. Um, and I suppose I'm going to put a, a Question to you, Liz, from Microsoft about, you know, what are the risks? Are there risks in a kind of one-size-fits-all approach um, to dealing with some of these issues? Uh, because clearly we have a number of different harms. We have different, as our colleagues from uh, Bangladesh have just said, different contexts in which we have to consider these, these issues. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Amy, and thank you for the great questions online. It's awesome to see the remote hub. I didn't know folks were gathering in different spaces, but that's brilliant. Um, I mean, so starting from our starting point as Microsoft, you know, we absolutely recognize that we have a responsibility to protect our users and particularly our youngest users and children from uh, legal and harmful online content and conduct. And part of the way in which we have to do that is through that incredibly necessary balancing of rights. Um, so children's rights in the round, thinking about it as holistically as possible. So advancing safety, but also thinking about privacy, um, as the questions just raised, around freedom of expression, around access to information and everything else. And I think in part answer to the, to the question that was just raised as well, I think the way that that um, happens is gonna be a combination of an ongoing need for both regulations, but also voluntary activities as we look to um, take on 
you know, and build in safety by privacy by design. But for us as Microsoft to really do that balancing effectively, one of the things we really have to think about is the differentiation. So thinking about the differences between the wide variety of online services that we have. I suspect most of you in the room will be familiar with one or more of uh, the wide variety of Microsoft's product suite. But I think, um, you know, what we have to really think about when we're thinking about it, a gaming versus a professional social network versus productivity tools is how we really tailor our safety interventions to the nature of that service. And so when we think about this, that's really at the heart of our approach, is how we think about safety and rights in a way that's proportionate um, and really, really tailored to the service and the harms in place. And that's at the heart of our internal standards and the way we think about safety by design as a company. And that includes when we think about what's appropriate in terms of parental controls, the guardrails that are in place, uh, whether we're thinking about what the business model looks like and the kind of platform architecture, or what's needed by the way the culture of the service and what we want to try foster in terms of user behaviour and the way that we educate users and parents on those services. Um, and really we have seen some challenges start to arise internationally where regulation has been really, really broadly scoped and creating that set of risk of one size fits all requirements. Um, and a really good example of that that we see a lot is a, a real enthusiasm uh, and you know desire to address some of the, the well-known issues arising from some of the social media services. But the definitions that can come through here may actually inadvertently capture a range of other services with measures that might not be appropriate or proportionate on those services. And so again, we really want to help think through what the right, what the appropriate safety measures are to really think about rights in a holistic way. I mean, I think that comes a little bit to the, the points that have just been made on thinking about privacy and safety and isolation as well. Because we, particularly in legislation, thinking about kids' privacy and safety, we see some kids' privacy bills, we see some safety bills, um, and again, these are not taking that holistic approach, or actually there are some laws as well we are coming through where there are concepts from safety legislation and concepts from privacy legislation in ways that may not entirely work together here. I mean, it, it's a challenge for us all because I don't think there is a, a perfect regulatory model for this yet. We are all still learning. One of the things that we are starting to see come through more um, is really a set of focus on outcomes-based codes. And so really thinking about what the, the flexibility is for different services and the scope of those codes to achieve the safety and privacy outcomes that are desired. Um, that does start to create a bit more of a, a web of uh, granular and complex secondary regulation. But I think it's the, the starting point where we really come to a place where we can evolve our approaches, really think systematically about risks, about rights, about impact on kids, and really think about what that looks like for the products where children are most vulnerable, but also where the opportunities arise. And so enabling us to think really holistically about risks and the mitigations for those, going through design and other choices. Um, and I think, you know, we are also still learning on the process of learning about what that looks like for some of those products. I know there are folks here at the IGF who are doing some amazing work in this space. I um, mean, I think one of the things we'll talk about as we come through too is there is still a need, I think, to grow some of the evidence base, particularly on emerging tech, to think about how we do this best. And so um, I'll come to that in the next part of the conversation. But I think the other piece I just want to flag as well, as we think about different legal regimes culturally, is that there is a risk that uh, globally we see uh, existing inequality, uh, sorry, economic and social disparities and other inequities really enhanced if there are regimes created where kids are unable to access technology. Thank you, and that and that, that really brings together the you know the, the importance of elevating children's rights and, and and how we design and how those are reflected within within policies and and indeed I mean. Patrick, if I'll go to you now, um, I think it's interesting. I've also been, you know, there's been some talk of, of, you know, fragmentation of regulatory policies. I'm also told that we shouldn't be using the word fragmentation in this context. But I think it is interesting in the United States, I know that's been a challenge, that you have state-based laws um, that, that may conflict uh, with, with federal laws, and that will be in other countries as well where you have those kind of structures. And I think there's, there's richness and diversity, perhaps in testing what goes wrong, but regulations take a long time to develop. So we can't just pivot in one month and decide we're gonna you know, create something new. And I think this is a challenge. So Patrick, um, you've seen this issue from many uh, perspectives, both from South Africa and your region, and of course globally. Um, and I know, um, you know you and I in the past have also spoken about, you know, uh, prevention versus regulatory approaches. So I just wonder what your perspective is on, on sort of 
differentiated approaches to regulations in different digital spaces, but also the balance between between these these different kind of not conflicting but but different factors. Yeah, thank, thanks, Amy. And it it it's quite hard to come after um, these amazing speakers who kind of taken all your thoughts and put them far more coherently than you could have. Um, so I think I'm just going to start off by reiterating what I, almost every speaker has said, that you know, I think um, while we speak quite quite glibly about child, child rights, what those means in different contexts, I'm not sure that we can altogether count on um, how child rights, even as they, contain, they are contained in the CRC and in general comment number 25, translate translate into practice in different cultural, religious, national, geographic contexts. Um, there is huge variation in how child rights are interpreted or where countries or, or um, states choose to place the emphasis. And inevitably, we see that emphasis being placed on particular rights um, rather than an equitable embracing of all child rights and that really tr translates so much into the digital space i apologize it's six o'clock i'm still not altogether coherent um but i also just want to say that i think start off by saying that i don't think we can regulate our way out of the challenges that emerging technologies immersive spaces ai present us with regulation we need to bear in mind is just one of those tools, one of those arrows in our quiver. Um, and I think we we often place so much emphasis on regulation and states put place so much, and when I say states, I mean nation states or states with the um, you know provinces, whatever they, they might be within within national boundaries, um, place so much emphasis on regulation because they see it as not an easy win, but it's 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 a very visible commitment to what they are doing and to their commitment to making sure that children stay safe online without investing without putting the sort of um, proportionate investment into as you say the prevention side of things the education the awareness raising building capacity of parents building capacity of children to deal building children's resilience the one thing that we haven't been sp spoken about um, and so regulation is critical we can't do away, away with regulation but it really is just one component of what we need in order to make sure that children's rights are realized online. Um, now, what does that mean for regulation? Liz mentioned this, this increasing focus on, on um, looking at secondary regulation, which is often quite messy. And I think it there is a lot to be said for, for that approach, because ultimately, Platforms operate in different ways. Services operate in different ways. There are some global standards, how data is managed, how data is protected, how data is collected, um, how data is used, for, for example, relating to children's pri pri privacy online and the right to protection. Um, those are standard, but at the same time, different services offer different opportunities for children to learn digital skills, to be creative online. We need to recognize that children have different evolving capacities at different ages in different contexts. And those evolving capacities are largely influenced by different contexts, geographical contexts in which they live. They, in those evolving capacities are influenced by the households they live in, by the access to non-digital services they have access. I mean, we know the link between what happens online and what happens offline. Um, and so I think having a sort of differentiated approach makes sense. I think it, 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 it is a logical approach, but we can't wait for that sort of regulation, regulatory environment to concretize. I think, Amy, you just summed it up perfectly. Regulations take a long time to implement, and we need to learn from the failures of regulation, and we need to see what's working, what isn't working. The same with le legislation. You started off this session talking about the gap between legislation and implementation. Well, it's you know, from, from the time we start formulating policy to the implementation and the evaluation of the implementation, you're talking 10 years, by which 
point we are in, in a whole different universe in terms of emerging technology. And so we need to look at what individual services can do, platforms can do. And I can't, I can't think about this without thinking that in order to achieve that, we need to make sure that we are all singing off the same hymn sheet when it comes to what child rights are and the transparent commitment and culture of child rights that any business industry government needs to be working from and the transparency around that. Am I making sense? I mean, hopefully you can kind of bring all of that together. I'm going to stop, but otherwise I'll just keep talking. No, thank you. And I, I hope you have some coffee, uh, coffee or tea by your side. But no, absolutely, it does make sense. And and indeed, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll ask, you know, Jenna for your input um, uh, on this. But I, I, I think absolutely um, the I'm losing my train of thought. Um, the um, the need for and we will talk now about a design approach and, a, and child rights based design approach that we, we can't wait for regulation. I think there is a strong role for it to provide a framework, to provide a, 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 a legal basis on which we can have conversations and decide how to act. But I mean, each one of us in this room has probably five, 10 stories about um, uh, the uptake of uh, uh, AI models or, or, or AI products. Um, we won't name any in particular. Um, and um, some of those are good, some of those are bad, um, but it's happening. Uh, faster than we have the ability to to take action. So we need to think very critically about where we go and actually build those into decision-making processes earlier on in the design of products, the, the the building of products, and that's what we will go on to. But Jana, I just wanted, before we do that, and then if we, we can take any reflections or, or questions from, from, from other, other um, participants in the room or online, Jana, what is your view on, um, from, from engaging with youth and through the youth um, sort of IGF, perspective what is um your view on uh regulation as a as a as uh, not as a solution but as a part of the solution to some of the challenges we face how do young people see that w what are the priorities for building a safe and empowering environment um i prepare some notes around it for of course um uh, but before i respond to your questions or theme two overall I want to quickly respond to what Patrick mentioned earlier about like how cultural uh, factors and um, just culture in general, like, let's frame it that way, will be so different. Because earlier this year, I part partnered with a group of amateur, we, we just do it voluntarily, all this uh, policy researcher actually Riyadh from Bangladesh Local Hub, actually we worked together to make a study and try to um, see how different jurisdictions in Asia Pacific deal with online safety. And from part of our study is that Australia adopted industry code to mitigate this issue where Singapore use a more government driven way. So it's kind of reflected some cultural influence in how we approach things. And I just find that, you know, it's it's really a fact that we have to admit because especially in Asia Pacific, it's really different. Myself and he's Asian. There are things that I can't understand completely from those who are from Southeast Asian and uh, South Asian. And sometimes we will be unconsciously biased and people sometimes from Western world do not think that Indians are Asian <laughs> as well. I, I find it quite interesting when, when I hear from some people sometimes. But anyway, uh, that's my quick response to it. And I will try to uh, touch on the question that you asked with the notes I prepared. Um, but most of these are like part of the outcome that we had from um, the discussion we had last month in Brisbane in our uh, any meeting. I think to deal with the f this very topic that we are trying to address today, the youth think that we need to have like a clear definition and scope of you know how how about all this online safety threat because uh, sometimes like different people of different background will have different definition and it's important to have um, international standard of course but also to have some localization to ad uh, adapt into it and so it's relevant to uh, to to their environment I think the other the other day I was attending a workshop and then they were doing capacity building even at a municipal level, B 
because that might be even more effective because I personally work so closely with youth as a pro, pro project uh, manager for uh, the Asia Pacific or IGF. I figure out that uh, we have to empower them uh, at many level in order to get their voice heard, especially when we talk about internet governance, uh, child rights online. If they don't really know about the technical aspect, they c sometimes they will suggest something that is not really relevant. Putting my other hat on, I actually work for the top level domain registry as well. Sometimes we think that we understand how uh, how the technology of internet work, but then when I talk to those engineers, they were like, all these details that enter the head, and they were like, that's not exactly what it is, but sure. So we need to have more stakeholder get into the conversation, because there's no way for everyone to understand everything. So we need to put all of them together. And if we are circling back to here, I, I'm going it too far. If we are trying to bring in the younger voice, I really want to, you know, shout out to Bangladesh. Actually, they started way far ahead because I I know that they have this kids IGF happening in the past two years, which is very progressive. Um, it's hard to get a five years old into our conversation here because there's like different levels. But at a kids level, it's really a good way to start early for them to start engaging them. There's no way for my mom to understand what we're here talking about. I've been here for a long time. She still has no idea what I'm doing. But what we really want to stress is that we need to have a multi-stakeholder approach. But in order to achieve that, we must have cap capacity building along, um, try to make information accessible, use more accessible languages as well. So people with different level of knowledge can understand and sometimes, and myself included, um, don't really speak English as the mother tongue. And so there's like loss in translation sometimes. That's also one of the, the barrier. And, and so if we really want to regulate and stuff, I think we really need to bring different voices into the process and you know, democratizing the process eventually. Thank you so much. I mean, you've hit on so many important points, and I think I love this. I often think of it as, you know, this th the regulation is being top down, but, you know, your point about the, the bottom up approach, not only among, you know, children themselves, but in, 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 in communities and actually building solutions through that. Um, and, and then when we go on to sort of the safety, the safety dimension that helps support that, I think, I think that that will be crucial. I know we have, uh, Jim, some collective comments or questions. Yeah. yeah. I'll just summarize it, but uh, just to pick up on the Bangladesh point, the second question was actually from the vice chair of the Bangladesh Youth IGF, so they're actively engaged there. Um, but between those questions, and we have a question here as, as well from Mohammed, who's an instructor at Kabul University in Afghanistan. Um, you know, I, I think as you're addressing these issues going forward, you know, what about the perspective and what can be done to help in developing countries like Bangladesh and Afghanistan address these problems? I think. Um, we all know the history of the, the challenges that these countries have with technology and access and uh, capacity building. So as we're discussing this forward, maybe think about that as part of your comments. Absolutely. I mean, d would anyone on the panel like to, to talk about how we can address some of those issues? I mean, I think, Janet, even you spoke a little bit about, you know, looking at different opportunities for, for codes of conduct that can be um, n not not copied exactly, but but that are based on some values, principles, some guidelines possibly that, that, that can be translated into, into your own context um, for the participant from Afghanistan. Um, I think learning from uh, approaches to regulation that can work possibly, but, but obviously understanding the context um, there. Um, and I suppose also back to Jenna's point, uh, making sure that the children and young people are, are consulted, find out what do they think, how do they feel, about these issues and, and, and trying to drive there. But again, I don't know if anyone, even in the room, would like to comment on that. Um, yeah, otherwise we'll take a question. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Andrew Campling, I run a um, public policy, public affairs consultancy, but also I'm a trustee of the Internet Watch Foundation, so probably more with that hat. 
it's a very big topic, so I'm trying to give, I'll give two fairly narrow points that are l at least linked in token ways to AI. Um, so f first one, algorithms um, quite obviously make uh, malicious content much more accessible um, through their recommendations. Uh, so for example, in the UK, uh, we've seen um, a, a child who uh, um, unfortunately was sort of shown uh, sort of suicide relevant content committed suicide um, it's highly improbable she would have found that content had the algorithm not sort of shown it to her um, so sort of first question should there be restrictions on the application of surveillance capitalism to children you know, a blanket prohibition of doing the data gathering um, of known child users on platforms uh, in, in the first place to try and prevent that from happening uh, secondly, uh, AI um, sort of models are already being used to generate CSAM. Um, so should AI-generated CSAM be illegal? It is in some countries, but it's a loophole um, uh, in others. And should prompts that are deliberately intended to generate CSAM, should the circulation of those be made illegal? Um, because there's an active trade that's the right phrase, in the best prompts to use to, to get the images. Um, and then more generally, sort of given the pace of technology change, and you said how difficult it is to create sort of regulation, it's easily sort of been outpaced by, by the changes in, in, in the tech. Dare I say it, learning from the, sort of the UK experience, should we try and avoid being caught out by the pace of change simply by imposing a duty of care um, on platforms of their users? because otherwise it's, it's pretty much impossible um, for regulators to keep up with, uh, with, with the changes. So just give the blanket duty of care and make put the problem um, on the platform operators to, to do that responsibly. Thank you. Thank you. Big questions. Um, I, I know that Patrick wants to come in. Oh, do you want to quickly speak to that and then we'll bring Patrick in? Oh, Patrick, go ahead. Thanks, Amy. Just two very quick responses. The first in the to the question from Afghanistan, and it's just a general observation. In so many of the countries in which I work, where where governments are trying to catch up on pol policy, they're trying to catch up on legislation. They're looking to key countries for model legislation. They they desperate to to look at best practice. And so what tends to happen is there are three or four countries that come to mind. They look at, at those countries and try to model their own legislation based on that without recognizing some of the challenges and the dilemmas that those pieces of legislation face um, or where they haven't got it right. And so there's a real danger in, in developing countries saying, OK, well, this is what country A has done. We're going to fo follow that model without any critical, critical engagement as to what the, some of the challenges in implementation might be. So that's just an observation. I think there's a real danger of doing that. And I do see that a lot in men, many of the countries that I work in, Southern Africa, North Africa, some of the Asian Pacific, small, some smaller island countries and territories. And then if I can just abuse my position, um, my mic, um, just in, in response to the question or the observation from, from the IWF colleague. The other thing that I've seen so many of the developing countries that I work is this issue around definitions. And now you raised the example of AI generated CSAM. What tends to happen is countries are loath to, to update their, their um, sexual violence, whatever legislation, their child sexual abuse, exploitation, um, crimes, offences are contained in because it takes so long. And that's where I think it's also up to individual industries and companies to say, we are going to adhere to these definitions of CSAM, and that includes AI-generated CSAM, so that it's actually a step ahead of changing national policy, because that is going to take five to ten years for that policy to update, because it's such a process for legislation to be updated. Thanks. Thanks, Patrick. Go, go ahead, Liz, and then I've got many follow-ups to give to, to the room. 
great. Well, I will, I will try to be brief. I mean, I think um, a couple of great questions from the IWF here, here in the room and things that are really top of mind for us. And actually, I think this goes to some of the, the points I was hoping to raise anyway. So excellent segue. Um, I mean, on the topic of AI-generated CSAM, I think certainly for us in industry, you know, it's thinking about these risks has absolutely been at the core of our responsible AI approach at Microsoft, but also how we're thinking about applying safety by design across the services where that's being deployed and the features in that. On the question of legality, I think this really goes to the some of the conversation we've just had around A, the criticality of regis uh, regulation, but also B, regulation not being the only tool in the toolkit. And I think it goes to, again, the we have to have the whole of society approach to addressing these problems. And part of that will be us taking responsibility to make sure that this particular horrific harm type is not being disseminated or created on our services. But secondly, that, that need for urgency and some regulation. I know in some jurisdictions there have already been statements around the legality of CSAM, but I think it speaks to some of the, the great work by um, the We Protect Global Alliance and others as well with the model national response to really help support harmonization on legal regimes in this so there are not spaces where this crime is permitted. Um, on the question of whether children should be able to access some services or not, two quick points in response, and I think part of this goes to the uh, references to safety by design across diverse services that I made before, and part of that is really thinking about where there are recommendation systems or other features, what impact that has on the risks to young people on the service and understanding the potential mitigations for that. But more broadly, I think you, you've kind of uh, raised one of the, the, the major topics under discussion in child rights and child safety conversations at the moment, which is obviously age assurance um, and the ability to identify whether users are indeed actually children. And there are multiple strands of work, I think, that are needed here really to, A, help us find the right tech solutions, um, noting that there are a range of trade-offs between sort of getting the right degree of accuracy around the age of a child versus privacy, security and other factors. But then B, once we do know the age of a child, what are the choices that we make around the safety interventions and indeed access to services on that? And I think this is where we are really, certainly as Microsoft, very keen to continue the conversations with the experts and grow our evidence on these topics. Thanks, I know we have some questions. I just wanna, um, Sophie, I don't know, because I know you're, you're waiting there with us online. I wonder if, you know, picking up on, on the point um, I think made about, um, um, uh, you know, the use of children's data, for example. I wonder if you have anything you'd like to say about, for example, the Digital Services Act and, and what that may uh, uh, kind of mean for sort, sort of protecting children's uh, data within the EU. Is that something you'd like to speak to or speak about the European context? Uh, yes, I can give a short insight. Um, so um, we have a, a digital services act uh, in the uh, European Union, European Union uh, which is going to be um, uh, in point um, next year. And we also have regulations um, following the DSA in Germany. Um, right now, we are discussing it a lot. And um, from the child rights perspective, um, we um, consider it a really important point to make and uh, a good way to protect the data of children, uh, especially when it comes to um, advertising, but also um, when it comes to uh, the responsibility of um, very large online platforms uh, to protect um, children and young people from certain risks. Um, I'd, I'd also like to um, add some uh, something to the um, idea of children's rights by design and also uh, on uh, children's participation in regulation uh, because I think this is a crucial aspect um, if we really want to think children's rights in a holistic way not only to to um, focus on the protection of uh, um, point all the time uh, but to do to do it to do it in a holistic way and also uh, looking for uh, how can we empower children, how can regulation support the empowerment of children, and also uh, uh, how can regulation um, support the participation of children, um, and um, how did because how digital me media are regulated and designed has a really direct influence on the lives of children and young people, but they, if we are honest, rarely have a say in these issues. 
um, the GC25 also addresses uh, this right of young people to participate in questions and decisions about the digital environment. And um, here in Germany, we've already uh, seen some efforts uh, to involve children and young people in the design and implementation of legal youth and media protection. Uh, and um, uh, we, uh, as a German children's fund, we've conducted uh, also an exploratory uh, research uh, and concluded in this context that we need quality criteria uh, for participation uh, in this point. And uh, we've encountered already a wide uh, variety of participation-oriented formats, um, such as consultations or comment processes where children are uh, included and involved in regulation processes. Um, we have youth juries, editorial boards, and uh, also young people who design products and even uh, uh, design and uh, conduct events on their own, uh, get involved in peer-to-peer -peer networks or consultations, and I'd be very interested in experiences from other countries. And um, this also leads me to the point um, uh, of um, safety by design, child rights um, by design, um, Children and adolescents need social spaces where they can really implement their own ideas without being primarily affected by product guidelines or market-driven interests, allowing them to exercise their right to open creative processes. And um, this likely clashes a bit with a metaverse concept um, whose hosts also target uh, young audiences. Um, so safe social spaces are more likely created by civil society and educational organizations. That's what, what we've seen so far. And um, the children, uh, the, the um, approach uh, children's rights by design offers um, providers the opportunity to place children and adolescents um, self-realization and participation really at the forefront and um, develop ideas on how to involve them as informants and full-fledged design partners. And this is also, and uh, uh, I think Patrick already mentioned it, um, um, an opportunity to bring in the, uh, the, the aspect of the evolving capacities uh, and to really look uh, uh, how to um, develop age-appropriate um, uh, uh, social online spaces and um, yeah. Thank you. That thank maybe on, on this part. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, Sophie. I, and I, 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 I'm sorry to cut you off um, because we have a queue of questions in the room. So we'll take some questions. Uh, please go ahead. <laughs> Hello, Aymana. I'm from Brazil. And right now in the National Council for Children's Rights, we are preparing a document with some guidelines and recommendations for the prosecutors, the public ministry, and all the services that work with children and adolescents, and what these agencies should do and require from platforms to protect children. Um, because how can platforms manage to remove uh, content from films, for example, and not remove violent or dangerous content for children? So how can we focus on protecting by design, like you were saying? Uh, because yes, there are standards, international standards, but they are not applied uh, equally. Uh, children, especially from the global south, have a, a much lower level from protection uh, than uh, those from the north. And we already have data to, to affirm that. And another question is about how we can um, legally framework, for example, images of uh, child abuse created by AI because um, we are thinking about this now because our, our legislation doesn't fit for, for these actions. So um, how have you been dealing with this in your countries, like apology for crime or incitation? So that's it, thank you. I will, I will quickly just see if, and then we'll take, Kasia, your, your question. Katz, I don't know if you would like to respond because uh, on this point of how you can think about uh, legislating for um, this, because this is the, the point you raised earlier um, in Japan, um, and how you can uh, sort of build awareness about the need to 
uh, uh, criminalize uh, these types of content. Yeah, thank you for uh, raising the issues. It's uh, quite important. But for Japan, so we don't have any regulation and policies to regulate that kind of AI-generated image so far. As uh, quite recently, the BBC uh, has a focus on that some kind of a AI generated some kind of a CSAM. Uh, uh, but uh, we couldn't have said, uh, we couldn't know about that kind of news from the Japanese media. I think uh, kind of a more responsibility of media in Japan. So they have to inform us that kind of a situation right now. Otherwise, it's uh, the normal people, we don't know about what's going on, the AIs. So I think uh, we need to know more about that kind of uh, new information. Maybe not only the media, we can have say collect information from SNS, whatever. So. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna declare that we'll all stay here for three more hours, so I hope you all have time. Unfortunately, we, we cannot, so uh, Kasia, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Katarzyna Stetiwa, and I represent the National Research Institute in Poland. But I would like to link my intervention to my previous experience in law enforcement and also in research uh, based on my um, education in criminology. Um, so actually, it's so live discussion that it only proves that we need more room uh, in the future for these sort of discussions. And uh, I wanted to thank you, uh, Katsuhiko, if my Japanese pronunciation is well, and Liz for all the comments related to uh, research and child rights in the uh, so dynamically developing uh, space. Um, I have recently conducted uh, research on the metaverse, uh, and I believe uh, research is a key, and research, research can also guide uh, the developing countries because uh, there is a chance to benefit from what has been found, find, uh, found out already. And the research can also guide uh, our future actions. So in this research, I analyze the darknet and I analyze the themes of conversations of people that are potentially sexually interested in children. <laughs> and I found out that there are three themes that are absolutely worrying. The first one is uh, that it's an environment uh, in which uh, people like that uh, can meet a child or can move conversation from publicly available spaces. The second is uh, that they can create uh, something what has already been said, that they ca can create AI-generated uh, CSAM. So imagine that someone uses uh, a picture or a video of a real child and transfer it into that, uh, uh, that sort of uh, material. It will be constant revictimization of a child that was uh, absolutely innocent. <laughs> And the third one is even more scary because it was about updating, upgrading uh, the existing CSAM into the VR uh, or um, metaverse oriented uh, frame. So um, it means for the victims, uh, the past ones and the future ones, a constant revictimization. And we should be definitely looking at this perspective and uh, the call for more robust research is, is uh, has never been more valid. Uh, so I would just like to uh, finalize this intervention with uh, with a focus on research as uh, as a potential uh, gateway to uh, more uh, like tailor made oriented uh, actions uh, for the safety of children. Thank you. Thank you so much. And and actually, I mean, it it it, it points to a really interesting point, Sophie, that you made about um, you know safe spaces being created by you know civil society organizations, communities, families, offline, and what, what should that look like in the metaverse? What can that look like? And are we ready, really, for that? Um, and of course, we haven't, I mean, we are short on time. We could speak about safety by design for a long time, but I think these are crucial issues we have to, we have to grapple with um, as, as we, you know, allow children to operate as they, as they want to, young people want to be engaged in these environments and also picking up on the point about what that means in different contexts, because a tool or an environment designed by a company in one country, one region, will not necessarily be meeting the needs of children in other environments or children of diverse identities. Um, so please. Um, hi, 
Hi, thank you so much for all the intervention. My name is Ahmad Karim. I'm from UN Women Regional Office for Asia and Pacific. Um, and I come from that angle of the discussion where when, whenever we have those kind of big topics, we tend to be gender blind in the conversation. And I wonder if there is some specificities uh, in related to uh, gender design that would relate more or would give more attention to girls and young adults and females and, and those who are could be affected more by the advancement of technology and where national laws is not considerate, where we put all the children in one basket, but then there are some marginalized and fragile groups that deserve more attention, especially from the design of technology itself. Thank you. I can jump in briefly on that. I mean, fundamentally, the lens we're certainly coming at this from is we want to unlock the economic, social, and educational power of technology, but really find a way to do that, to do that by using it mindfully and safely. And you can't do that without being alive to the gender element. Um, so I think absolutely. Where I think we are still, again, in need of a better understanding, we have, we've done consumer research for a long time now. There's a lot of good work underway, but I don't still don't think we necessarily have the right level of understanding of some of those gendered impacts. Um, and I think one of the only ways to do that actually goes to back to the, some of the first conversation we had around youth participation, because um, as a millennial who got a device in high school rather than uh, <laughs> in kindergarten, I know that I don't have an understanding of what it looks for a, a teenage girl online, um, let alone in a diverse range of cultures. I'm a New Zealander, I come with that particular lens. There are a whole range of lenses I don't bring. So finding those ways to, to do that research um, and to get those perspectives. Um, and we, we know that it's, it, as a company, you know, we don't always have the right ways of doing that either and getting doing that mindfully in a way that is really asking questions of kids at the right age in the right places and doing that safely as well so that they're um, feeling really empowered to share. And I think it goes a little bit to some of the capacity building you talked about as well. Um, maybe I can jump in a little bit uh, to quickly respond to Emmett's points about gender and youth participation. Um, actually, my colleagues uh, right here, they are going to talk about something about gender tomorrow morning. Um, about like they, they are even younger than me, let's be real. And then they often give up points that I don't even touch on. They design the workshop from that perspective because they think it's very important. Their interpretations about on, on gender is different from what we historically design. And that's really important. And I got invited to a panel about how we leverage AI to ensure gender inclusivity. And suddenly when I prepared a session, I was like, why am I even invited to that? Because I am just one of those ordinary one heterosexual person with really ordinary point. Why am I even on there? And and so so I I feel like, you know, with 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 talking to more young people, you will get some new insights from how they think. As, ha as much as we dedicate the time to talk about CSAM, I think it's really important for us to address that. And I do think that we should, you know, instead of just create one big bill to deal with how, how AI in influence all this matter, I, I think government and all stakeholders should modernize different uh, existing legal framework, like um, modernizing like Broadcasting, Broadcasting Act, Consumer Protection Act, Competition Act, to, to make sure all this matters are integrated into it and so public interest or the younger generation's uh, ideas are in are considered while we are creating all these like policies while we are talking so much about uh, CSAM last last month when I was like uh, in, in Brisbane talking with all these Asia Pacific youth their workshop designed something about explicit content they have a totally different approach because I think when, when, when it comes to CSAM maybe as an adult, we care how we protect them, which is very important. But they actually want to explore how we, how they and maybe we use explicit content to express themselves. And so they, they actually uh, talk about like OnlyFans, so kind of platform, how we create a safe space for those who want to express themselves through those content. Uh, which sometimes we forget to talk about it. This is also their right to exp you know, to express themselves if they want to. And so that's just one thing that that actually surprised me a lot because I never thought about it. Um, probably I'm too conservative in some way. Um, but that's something we should, that, that, that is why we must bring them because we will always find something new 
we as an adult think they need this, but, but maybe it's actually not. So we should have them. That and we, we have a few minutes left for final reflections, but that's a perfect place to bring us home because ultimately this is about creating safe, empowering spaces where you need regulation to do certain things. You need design to be mindful and informed by child participants, so um, by child consultation and participation. So uh, f mm, in three mi two minutes, but I'm maybe going to, you know, take an extra minute um, if we can. I'd like to invite all our panelists to just give maybe a final reflection on um, what they've heard today, something that really stands out, What, w perhaps even just what would be your, if, if you had to, uh, yeah, your takeaway, but what thing you would do tomorrow um, in response to this session. And I'll go first online to Patrick. Um, Th thanks, Amy. And it's really hard to follow up from Jenna because, as you say, I think that is the perfect way to wrap it up. Uh, I had two notes. The one was speak and engage, not speak to engage and hear from meaningfully children in different contexts, their understanding, their experiences, both positive and negative, and how they want to use the in internet. And that means that we need to be open as adults to challenge our own thinking around this um, because we need to let young people who, who are the core focus here determine um, or, or dictate, feed into that space. The second is also my second point I just wanted to conclude with was it was great to hear the speaker, the speaker from Poland the, the in the audience um, who's a criminologist. The other point that I'd wanted to, to make when I was talking is we need to have criminologists, violence prevention, public health, educators, social workers, all of those sectors and specialities around and child rights legal experts in this conversation. It cannot come down to industry, to government, to regulation. We need to make sure that we have all of those pieces fitting together um, in order to make this work. Thank you, Amy, and th thanks to sp speakers for a great conversation. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, very, very short, if possible, just your main reflection. Um, yeah, thanks to everyone uh, for your inputs, to the speakers, to the audience. I think um, my learning from today is um, that to advocate children's rights in the digital world uh, in, in terms of a holistic approach, we need so many stakeholders. And it's important really to uh, grab them all and uh, go this way and um, especially to go this way with um, children and young people themselves as a really important participant group in this um, context. Thank you. Uh, Kat, I'll go to you for a final reflection, if I may. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, your brainstorming session. So I really appreciate so your input in uh, encouragement everywhere. So I think uh, uh, whatever the design, whatever the has regulation policies, all the time we should move on to the rights rights based approach. That is most important. Whatever the human rights or child rights, very difficult very important, significant approach. Then also, uh, in the past, probably we made an effort to more approach to public or people, but in the future, maybe to approach to AI in the future. So we need to more have the approach, the target will be increased in the future, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, very briefly, Jen, uh, Jenna, and then and, and then Liz. I will be really brief because I, I think I've had taken uh, enough airtime. Uh, I think one last takeaway is collaborations, I would say, because uh, as someone who work on capacity building, I need research to back up all the things that I do. And then we, you know, all the stakeholder work together is that, you know, in terms of like legislation, regulations, we need government, private sector, and everyone to work together to give a safe environment. And uh, of course, don't miss out the technical community, please, because they are very important. They have all the knowledge and sometimes they might not um, might not be the best in uh, best involved in the policy making process. So 
So yeah, that's just my final words. Thank you. I'll be really brief. Um, I think my takeaway today is to continue to try to approach this in the in the spirit of of learning, um, learning from others, uh, learning to try to keep uh, the holistic approach in mind. And we need to to grapple with different harms, but we need to find a way to do that while also thinking about rights. And I think it's 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 a complex area, and we we'll have to keep learning together. Hello. Yep. Sorry. Um, I, I won't summarize this. We are over time. Um, but it's been a really fascinating conversation, and I genuinely wish we had more time. Um, but as someone commented, we um we need to continue this conversation. Um, if anyone is interested to join the Dynamic Coalition and to continue these types of conversations, we have some flyers. There is a QR code. Um, you can you can go to the website. You can also go on the IGF website, find us, and sign up to the mailing list. We want to help create a space within the IGF, a bigger space, a, a renewed space for, for children's rights issues to be discussed. I will end it now. Um, thank you so much for being here. And thank you to all our speakers. And thank you to Jim as our online moderator. And thank you to uh, Bangladesh Remote Hub. It was so lovely to have you here and all participants online. Thank you. <laughs>